Hello and welcome to the Trap Little Podcast. I'm your host, Dan Runcy. Our guest today is Lindsay Riebling, who is the VP of Insights and Strategy at Revolt. She is also the mastermind behind Revolt's new study called Gen Hip Hop. Lindsay, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. This is also our first time meeting IRL. This is true. <laughs> After the, I think a few times I was in LA, I was like, oh, we should meet up. But yeah. That's what I'm saying. We've been pen pals for like a year now. <laughs> it's great to meet in person. You had reached out to me a few months back. I think this was back in the summer or fall and said, hey, we're working on this study. I think it would be right up your alley. We are doing an analysis on hip hop and what it means. And that perked my interest. It would be great to hear a little bit from you. What is gen hip hop? What does that mean? So the name just kind of took place organically as we got through this study. I mean, for context, I'm sure we'll talk through this too, but this was something I've been at Revolt for just over two years now. And when I first started two years ago, I was like, we have to do this. There's so much public information about the spending power of millennials or the spending power of black consumers in America. And there's absolutely nothing about the hip hop audience. And it's the largest listening audience in America, in the world at this point, streaming. So Generation Hip Hop just kind of became what I was referring to as this listening audience. And we were going to meetings and I was like, this, you know, massive generation, Generation Hip Hop. And then as we got through this study, it didn't really have a name in the beginning. It was just this piece of work we were doing, trying to understand the audience. And it just stuck. I just kept Gen Hip Hop, Gen Hip Hop. And that's just what it was. And so through this work, we've now been able to really define who makes up Generation Hip Hop. And I won't drop stats every time we talk here, but it's half of the youth population in America. And so that came out of these findings is when we were trying to kind of quantify who actually listens to hip hop and what it looks like demographically. One out of every two young people in America rank hip hop a top three genre. Wow. So it's like, I was just having this conversation earlier. I think it's so cringy when people try to target people based on demographics, like oh, we're going to talk to all Hispanic people ages 18 to 24. And it's like, that's not a thing. Like, you can't just, like, put this blanket statement around a whole ethnicity. So I think it's been a passion of mine to try and bring this piece of work to life because when you are trying to target a certain group of people, like youth, you can't just talk to them based on their skin color or their age. But one thing you can talk to them is based on their passion. And hip-hop is such a huge one for this generation. That's a good point because when we think about demographic studies, yes, that is what it is on paper. But what are you trying to get out of a Latino audience? What are you trying to get out of a black audience? And if this is the unifying thing, you're able to grab that. Reading through the report, it was interesting how you had strategies and suggestions too. Was a lot of that, this is what you can use as an actionable result or insight based on this finding? Oh, totally. So yeah, there's five chapters total in the report and each one kind of wraps up with a brand strategy section. And we tried not to make it like crazy overwhelming, like, you know, go spend $2 million doing this, but here's just some like suggestions of things you could do today. I think a lot of times in my industry, in the research insights industry, people give you this like huge lofty finding at the end. It's like, oh, you should go do this. And it seems unattainable. And you're like, I can't do that. And so we try to make ours very, very tangible and stuff as simple as like, you know, if you're trying to talk about politics, this is who you should be connecting with. And don't think of music artists as just artists and just the mouthbeats. They actually have personalities and they, you know, have their own takes on politics. So how can you look to more non-traditional quote unquote influencers in whatever space you're in? As part of this piece, we did expert interviews. So we did talk to the infamous Andre Harrell, if you're familiar with who I refer to as my uncle Andre, he would be great on this podcast too. We need to set that up. I also spoke to the notorious PhD, Dr. Todd Boyd, who's an amazing, amazing pillar just in the hip hop community, but also culture overall. Uh, he's at USC. He's a chair of race and popular culture. And so he had a really interesting perspective from academia. And then we also talked to an amazing young woman, Doris Munoz, who started her own management company to try and give people who aren't from this country a platform for hip hop culture. And so a lot of the strategy section kind of came from those perspectives too, Mm -hmm. not just, you know, what we absorb from talking to young people, but also from more of an academic standpoint, talking to industry OGs and kind of seeing how we could 
freshen that up for the next generation. The Andre Harrell interview stuck out to me. Mm-hmm. He he mentioned something interesting. Like one of his memorable quotes was around influencers and how he felt like in his generation, everyone wanted to be a rapper. People wanted to be into the game making music. But he felt like now this generation is more interested with being an influencer. Mm-hmm. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think the definition of fame has changed so much since he first started till now. And I I will give Andre so much credit because I think he also knows that he's looking at it from an OG perspective. And so he's very conscious of the fact of like, you know, he tries not to be like, oh, back in my day. Like, he realizes, like, times have shifted and different things are important to people now. And so he always kind of credits both himself and Puff with starting this kind of ghetto fabulous movement of, like, I might be from the projects, I might be from this area, but I want to get out. I want to live in Beverly Hills. And, live and so when he was starting off, that was kind of his vision of what success looked like. And so I think for him now, it's kind of this irony of, like, it's no longer about getting out and making it into Beverly Hills. It's about how many followers do you have and for him that's like a little hard to wrap your mind around but it's reality today when i read it and hearing your breakdown i think about why hip-hop rose this was a platform that people didn't necessarily have you use this as your outlet whether it was the black cnn like public enemy used to refer to it this was your platform because black america didn't have anything outside of that Influence and Instagram democratizes so much of that. So that then becomes a easier, not necessarily easier, but that becomes another alternative to be able to have that voice. So in a lot of ways, the people that are choosing to rap actually want to rap. And not that that takes anything away from the people that did it before, but because things are fragmented and there's more ways to get that direct point across, you're seeing things play out a little differently than back in his uptown days. Oh, totally. And I think it's such a good point about hip hop giving people a platform before. And now that we have accessibility to the internet and to social media, it just kind of like flattening the landscape. It's super interesting. I mean, even you think about how that plays out, I'm sure you've probably talked about this before, but like on the A&R side and like, you know, discovery and what that looks like and how before the fight to be seen and the fight to get exposure, it was a much more of a battle versus now you have people throwing up something on YouTube and it's like accessible for everyone in the industry. So it's definitely an interesting place we're at. I think we have a lot of talks internally about what the future looks like because of that. It's hard to predict. I wish I had a crystal ball to say what it's going to look like 10 years, 20, 30 years from now. Mm -hmm. But I think we're all really kind of enjoying this weird space we're in right now. What surprised you most about the study? Mm -hmm. Good question. I think now that I've been kind of on this like whirlwind tour of talking about this, this study was just as much validation as it was exploration. And that was a nice tweet, right? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There's your tweetable moment. Tarek, if you're listening to this podcast, Lindsay has one tweetable moment. <laughs> right. I came with my tweets prepared, my motivational statements. No, it truly was, though. Like, I don't want to say I because this was such a team effort. But initially, when I was trying to push this initiative forward, I knew we all have so many hypotheses in the industry, you know, internally at Revolve, but also in the music industry overall. We all had these gut feelings of like, I know this is what hip hop is. I know this is who's listening to it. I know this is what this looks like. But we've never been able to put that in front of a brand partner or one of our distribution partners and say, look, this is proof. This is what they look like. And so a big part of this study was just being able to validate all of our gut hypothesis. And so there is a fair amount, like the spending power, 400 hundred fifty three billion dollars like we knew they had billions of dollars but now we can finally finally like go out and yell that from the rooftops and so some of it was just validating these things we already knew i think some of them did you know it was that high uh no 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 no, no, if you had to guess before what would you have said oh god i probably would have gone over a hundred billion okay but i don't know that i would have gone over 400 billion right it was a jarring number to look at when i saw it yeah You know, I mean, if you think about it, we're talking about ages 13 to 34, who like a lot of them are all coming into their spending power right now too, like fresh, you know, out of college and getting money and in your 30s, you're finally caught your groove. And so it is a huge, huge audience too. But as far as most surprising, I think for me, a lot of the surprising and stuff that ironically 
it went into the study not knowing how it was going to turn out. And then the back end, seeing the results, I was like, ooh, it was more in the sexuality section. There's an entire section all about kind of gender identity and sexuality and how hip hop has really shifted from a scary space to now a platform for talking about stereotypical gender roles and what that looks like today and the fact that we're knocking down these stereotypes and you have people like Tyler the Creator or Jaden, you know, painting their nails and taking on more quote-unquote feminine characteristics. And that section to me was just fascinating. I think, you know, one of the findings was one in three young people have experimented with a gender identity other than the one they were assigned at birth. I mean, those numbers are crazy. I knew they were high. I've been doing this for a minute. I've been studying youth culture for 10 years now. I know those numbers are high when you talk about LGBTQ, but actually seeing one in three was super interesting to me. And I love that as society, we've gotten to a place where people can find the answer truthfully when we ask them questions like that. Right. I've often thought about that and I've looked back and tried to determine when did that change start to happen? Because it's been great to see even a lot of the reception that Lil Nas X got in this past year after he came out, I think was strong. But I often look back and say, when did that happen? Was it around the time of Frank Ocean? Was it before that? What do you think? I'm not able to like pinpoint either, but it is interesting. And just to go back to what we talked about earlier, like when you think about the rise of technology and the internet, and then, you know, this conversation on the rise as well, I just don't feel like Frank Ocean got the exposure that Lil Nas X did, but also maybe it's because we're at a time now where we're more likely to tune into Twitter than we are to the TV. So I don't know if it's just where we're at as a culture, but I totally agree that I think Frank Ocean was received well, but not, there's something almost frustrating about that too, because with Lil Nas X, it's like now every single headline you see, they have to kind of put in there like openly out. And it's like, okay, we don't need to label him. So like the more that we can normalize it as a culture shows the progression. Exactly. And I mean, one of my favorite people of recent times that I think has done a really great job of that is Kehlani. Mm -hmm. I mean, she, like, does not give any fucks, and I love it. It wasn't this, like, grand statement or, like, I'm gonna, you know, come out in order. It literally was like, yeah, I'm having a baby with this guy, and we're not together, and I unidentify as fluted. He identifies this way, and this is the modern family. If you like it, great. If not, go fuck yourself. And I feel like she has done an amazing job at just normalizing it and not letting it define who she is. And, I mean, that's true for a lot of artists. I'm not taking away from anyone at all. And then she went from that situation to dating YG, who a lot of people would define as like hyper masculine in a lot of ways. So I think that she has been an amazing person who's really kind of broken down barriers for a lot of people. With the study itself, was there anything that you had wanted to validate or things that you thought would have came up but didn't? Okay, I'm going to answer that in two parts. Something I wanted to validate and I did get to, which was super, super exciting, was kind of the ethnicity breakdown of the hip-hop audience because that was something that I had a lot of gut feelings about. So for anyone watching this or listening to this, sorry, just for like visuals, I'm obviously a white woman. And me working in hip-hop, like I come from a very like hip-hop based back. I grew up in South Florida. I grew up on Cash Money, Trick Daddy, Trina. Like that is my upbringing. I think the first CD I ever owned was Outkast Stankonia. Like I grew up on hip-hop, but also like, stereotypically, optically, if you looked at me, I'm a white girl with green hair, you might not go like, oh, she's a hip hop head. But that's the whole point is you can't do that anymore. You can't look at somebody. You should have never done that, but you definitely can't. You can no longer look at someone and say like, oh, I think they listen to country music. Oh, I think they must listen to heavy metal. It's so not a thing in the society we live in. And I think getting to prove that in numbers and show like we live in America and America is majority white still, which is always shocking to me because I've always lived in metropolitan areas that are not. But if you look at America as a whole, it is. And so when you look at the hip hop listening audience as a whole, it is still predominantly white, which is fascinating because I think that I've had this conversation with a few friends in the industry. A lot of marketers and advertisers are so bad at using black audience and hip hop audience interchangeably. They're like, oh, we want to target the urban audience. We want to target the hip hop audience. No, no, no. What are you actually saying? Like, are you actually trying to reach the black audience? Because that might not be exactly what you want. Right. There's not a set overlap. I can name several black people that have no interest in listening to hip hop at all. Exactly. So that was 
a huge, huge win for me, being able to now go to our partners and go, okay, when you're talking to the hip hop audience, when you're talking to our audience, this is who you're actually getting, which is great because it's multicultural and you're getting people who are much more likely to vote, much more influential, much more likely to share their opinion on social media. And so that was exciting for me. I think it's getting to bring those people to life. But back to your question about, is there something I really wanted to and haven't really gotten to? Something I've already been thinking about for volume two is like this one was called Power and Numbers. We did a lot of plays on songs and albums and whatever. So mm-hmm. I really want to do a second volume next year to be something like Dollar Dollar Bills, y'all, and just talk about how we spend our money. We have $450 billion. Really want to do a deep dive into what that looks like, where we're spending, what makes us spend money. I say us because I'm part of Generation Hip Hop, but I know you are too. But I definitely want to dive deeper into. What kind of makes us make the purchases we make, how we spend our dollar, what we think about? What are those key things? We have all this income, not necessarily all this disposable income because the economy we live in, but you know, what's making us spend a dollar one place versus another? I saw that breakdown of spending in the guide and there were a few things, of course, there was fashion, but food, I think food was one of the top ones that stuck out. And of course, my mind immediately went to like, okay, what are the brand partnerships in this space that are taking advantage of this? And the first thing that come to mind was Migos and Popeyes and Uber Eats and that whole ad campaign that they did. Those are the type of things that would probably come out since eating out is such a high expenditure. It's so funny because I think, oh, actually, not to bring up our friend Tark again, but Tark and I were joking when he read that and he was like, oh, we need to make a cooking show because these people are just wasting all their dollars on eating out. We need to teach these young people how to cook more. <laughs> I don't know if that's it. <laughs> and I was like, I'm so guilty of like, I'm definitely, my number one expense is definitely food. But yeah, I think that's like a great example of a space that hasn't truly been tapped into when you think about the hip hop perspective. There's definitely been a few examples like you mentioned, but I think there's like, you know, like you said, it was eating out, it was fashion, beauty, Beauty is such a huge space where I feel like if you just close your eyes right now and think of a quote unquote like beauty campaign, everyone pictures the same thing. It's like that girl washing her face in the mirror or like, you know, some cleanser. But no one has really talked about it through the lens of hip hop or like what it actually looks like. I think as a society, we've started to kind of break down the wall of transparency. I think social media helped do that a lot. Like marketing back in the day used to be like super glossy ads. Everything looks photoshopped, overly perfect. And I think we've gotten to a space where social media has helped us be like, no, 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 this is reality. Maybe with like a filter on it, but still somewhat reality. Especially for this audience, like that's where marketing needs to go in the future. It needs to be more real. It needs to be more gritty. It needs to be pulled the curtain back. And I think there's so many spaces, especially in those industries, where we can be doing a better job of that. Is there anyone that you think is doing a good job of that now? I can think of a few brands that I think do a good job at pulling the curtain back. I can't think of any who do it like kind of with the intersection through a hip hop lens and also transparent as well. One of the ones I will give some credit to... Procter & Gamble, I think, has done some interesting work yeah. around trying to bring a voice to these things. And one of my close friends has been pretty involved in that ad campaign. And I remember getting a few behind the scenes like, hey, what do you all think of this? Like months before, I think it was the talk one that they had done air. Oh, I've pretty much cried at all of those. Just that's yeah. <laughs> They're, they're, they're <laughs> legit. Know, yeah. They're legit. So they're ones that stick out to me, especially just given the size of that brand. I think the one that came to mind for me is, and this is horrible if I'm referencing the wrong company, but I think it was Domino's who did like the, hey, like this was a few years ago, but they were like, hey, we get it. Our crust sucks. So we're going to fix it. And like totally have gone that route of like, we heard you. Our crust was garbage. Don't worry we're about to redo it. And I really love that. Like, let's just talk about the elephant in the room. And I appreciate that. Like I would be 10 times more likely to go try that pizza now just because the way you approached it. And I agree that I think PMG does a really great job at, talking about things from a more authentic emotional level. Something I'm excited about this year that I really want to try and help people do a better job on is talking about politics from that hip hop lens. Don't think anyone is killing it right now. I think traditionally in politics, you have a lot of people talking at us, not with us. Are you talking about presidential candidates trying to connect to communities? Are you talking more like a 
Mark Lamont Hill, someone like that trying to be the bridge, like, or both? Or? Yeah, I think both. I think, yes, mostly politicians trying to connect with this community. Everyone seems so not tangible and so far away and so forced. We did a short study last year about, like, what helps you understand who you want to vote for. The main thing was, like, people who care about my interests in my community. And I get that it's a hard thing to do. And as a politician, you have to remain, you know, somewhat broad to get the most people in one swoop. But I would love to see somebody take the approach of being a bit more, you know, no, I care about this specific thing in this community and I'm going to lean into that. It'd be interesting to see what happens. Thinking about this study, it'd be interesting to see who is Gen Hip Hop supporting right now. We're obviously airing this in the thick of the Democratic primary. I definitely have my thoughts on where Gen Hip Hop is leaning, but that would be interesting because I think from a candidate perspective, Everyone, at least on the Democratic side, is trying to go through the breakfast club or go on the typical interview routes and, you know, Mayor Pete and Charlemagne are doing their whole campaign with South Carolina. But what is the next layer of that that doesn't get people just being like made fun of, honestly, deservedly so on right. social media? Right. What does that look like? Yeah. yeah. So we did this last year. It might have actually been two years ago at this point. But we did do a kind of quick hot take survey just to understand how hip hop listeners voted or what party they associated with. And I was actually really surprised at the fact it was, and don't quote me on this, but it was roughly like a third Republican. So it was like, let's say 60% Democratic, maybe like 25, 30% Republican. And then there was a small slice that was either undecided or private party. And, but I thought, it's so interesting because, A, I think people make a lot of assumptions that all hip-hop listeners are Democratic and they're all liberals. It's not necessarily, in my opinion, that people who listen to hip-hop are Democratic or Republican. It's the fact that, like, again, most of America, half of all youth in America listen to hip-hop. So it's not that hip-hop listeners are Republican. It's that Republican young people also listen to hip-hop. Which goes back to what you were trying to say, yes. the, the validation of this. Exactly. Study. Like, you can't just make these assumptions. And I think a lot of times when we're talking about that, which I don't want to give <laughs> the Republican Party any pro tips because I'm not trying to help them. <laughs> because I could think someone could listen to this and be like, okay, Lizzie Reevlick said that we got to in 2024. Right, like, wait a minute. You know, I should everywhere. associate myself with generation of hip-hop. That's a great idea. But it was interesting to see how that fell out. And I think it would be super interesting to see, now that we're getting closer, who they're leaning into. And it's also interesting, too, because this is clearly a space that you are passionate about. You've done this type of work even before you came to Revolt at... Ticketmaster, and you did YouTube's Gen C study, right? Which I think there were some similar parallels with this and that. Why is this work important to you? Yeah, it's so interesting because I didn't set out in this career with this whole thing of like, I'm going to do generational work, or I'm going to do youth culture. The real answer is I just always, always loved psychology and marketing. And when I found out Consumer Insights was a job, I had never even heard of that. And I actually had a professor, like junior in college, who was doing Consumer Insights for Banana Republic and basically got paid to go shopping with people. And I was like, I'm sorry, what is that thing? I could just get paid to talk to people. Like, I love talking. I can do this. So I kind of just like fell into it. And I started my career at MTV. I was interning at MTV. And I was like getting, well, I wasn't really getting paid. I think I got like a Metro card, but <laughs> I was an intern. But I was there and I was literally just talking to people all day about like, Teen Mom and Jersey Shore, and this is like 10 years ago now, so in the heyday of MTV. And I was like, this is an amazing career. Like, I am here, and I'm the middleman between our audience and our senior production team. And our department head would pull me in, and I'm like, I don't know, like 21, 22 at this point. I would pull me into these senior production meetings, and I'm there with like all these much older, mostly men, and they would just like hang on to every word I said because they were like, oh, she gets it. She knows what these young people are talking about. And I mean, I could have said anything. They're like, yes, yes, tacos. Everyone loves tacos. Amazing. So kind of understanding like, oh, there's something here that if I can be this like platform for young people and understand youth culture, but also helping the brands I'm working with better connect with them and create better content and better campaigns and not just, you know, these stereotypical ones of what they think works. It's kind of a fulfilling job. So no matter where I've gone or what I've done, I've always got that same fulfillment, whether it's like helping Ticketmaster better their fan experience and help fans have a better time where they're going to football games, or it's at Revolt now helping kind of our partners and our clients understand the hip hop audience better. It's a really filling job that I wish more people knew about. 
and transparently one that, in my opinion, needs a lot more diversity of thought because the insights industry is not that diverse when I go to conferences and it is a lot older. Typically, if people get into this career like further along in their career. So it's one that I'd like to go out and talk about a lot because I hope somebody listening to this gets inspired and is like, oh, wait, she does what? She gets paid to go talk to people at Rolling Loud? I want to do that. So it's a really fun job. I get to travel a lot. And it's really fulfilling when you see kind of all of your labor come to life like this study. What's the toughest part of it? Of course, I know that the validation and a lot of that can be challenging if you're not getting the response. But are there any other challenges or roadblocks that you feel like you often hit? Yeah, I think there's a huge quant bias that exists in the industry, and I am somebody who's really passionate about qualitative work. I feel like when you do quant work, so, you know, surveys and you're understanding the numbers, you're looking at data analysis, that tells you what. It's like, oh, more people are buying green cups than they're buying red cups, but it does not tell you why. And so that's always been my passion, just understanding kind of the psychology and the behaviors around why people are making the decisions they're making. But I think, unfortunately... In almost every industry, people just have this thing. When they see a number, they automatically believe it. They don't know where that number came from. They don't know the methodology behind it. But if I tell you right now, 97% of people are more likely to buy that red cup than the green cup. People are like, oh, boom, that's it. Red cups, that's it. It's like, no, how do you know that I didn't put them in front of the green one? People don't ever challenge numbers. They just believe them. And so that's a huge frustration for me. It's a lot of times when I'm presenting deeper qualitative work that I know to be true from talking to 75 people nationwide. People just have this like bias of like, oh, but what's the numbers? Oh, you didn't talk to 1500 people. Oh, you didn't do a, an outdated online survey. Oh, okay. No. And so that can be frustrating because especially when you're talking about trends and trend tracking and where the future is going, you can't always rely on like past looking data to tell you the future of our business. So that's an ongoing fight. Hopefully that wasn't too nerdy. I think as well, you could see where this report took as an opportunity to correct for some of that with making sure that storytelling behind the data and with the data is a big part of it. Because not that I think any of the insights were hidden in any type of way, but you had to read to understand the insights. You couldn't just be like, okay, percentage, move on. Yeah. So this is also like really unique. Sorry, people listening. We keep pointing to this magazine in front of us. But if you want more, actually, everyone can go to genhiphopstudy.com if people want to see a copy of it. Dan was so lovely to have a copy sitting right in front of us. I'm pointing to it. And this is really, really, really unique for the industry. So typically when people do a huge research study like this, they put it into a PDF and it is like, a 30 page word document that lives on the internet somewhere and people might click into it and they never see it again. But like people do not spend the time or the dollars to get it designed beautifully, get it custom photographs taken. All the photography in here was ours that we owned. We took at our events. It's all actual consumers. I brought on two amazing photographers and told them, I want you to shoot the consumers as rock stars it's all about the audience. It's not about the talent. And so we put a lot, a lot of love and a lot of amazing people were involved in this and putting it into this output specifically for what you're saying. It's like, I didn't want to do a PDF that's going to be on somebody's desktop and wind up in the trash can or that people are never going to read and being able to put this in people's hands, like quick humble brag. I was able to go to an event at Soho house recently. It was this like intimate dinner with Zane Lowe and we took copies there and I handed him one. And he literally stopped his conversation and was like, wait, what is this? Like, I want to know more. Tell me more. And then came over afterwards and was like, I just want to say congratulations. Like, this is so dope. And the fact you guys made a physical thing, I'm going to take this home and read it. And I'm going to spend time with this. And like, if it would have been a digital thing, who knows if someone would have actually read the whole thing or not. But, you know, that's the reaction that's been so rewarding for me is like when you put that so much time and energy and money into something and then seeing people understand and value it, it's I can't ask for anything more. What does a study like this do for Revolt? What does it do for the company? This really secured our space is the authority on hip hop culture. We do a great job, I think, from a consumer perspective of being that. And, you know, we're close up now, upwards of a million followers on social media. And we have a great presence there. But we've never really carved out this level of time and energy into doing something for the industry to really put our stake in the ground is the authority on hip hop culture and the hip hop audience. And so this has allowed us to unlock a lot of doors in the most basic sense. It's open doors for ad sales meetings, for distribution meetings. And, you know, it gives us a reason to help people understand who they're talking to. But it also, you know, back to what we were talking about earlier, just 
we're the one who did this work. You could never Google this work beforehand and understand all these things, the buying power, the demographic makeup, the whatever. You can't do that before. And so now when people go online and they're searching for that, Revolt is the one who did that work. And so it was amazing getting to own that. Billboard actually exclusively launched this for us. And so it's gotten us a lot of exposure and it's allowed us to be the go-to now. When you think of hip hop culture and wanting to reach them, you should think of Revolt. I've had a few people that have asked me questions. Like I'm thinking randomly on Twitter, someone asked me, what is the total size of the hip hop market? And this was months before you put the report out. And I remember having to send them to some source that was a hybrid of music industry revenue and grouped by genre. But that, of course, doesn't capture any of the other non music revenue aspects of the culture. So I think even from like a baseline perspective, being able to have something like that, that people can go to as a resource makes a big difference. Oh, totally. And I think ironically, initially when we started to do this, it was a very B2B play. It was like us putting our stake in the ground for the industry. Like you want to talk to hip hop, you want to talk to us. But then as it started to come to life, especially in the last six weeks since it's been out, it's been so rewarding and beautiful to see how many of our consumers actually want to get their hands on it. I mean, we're talking to a generation of entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. and this audience wants to understand their value too. And that's been very cool. And it wasn't something expected when we started to do it. We thought, of course, industry people will appreciate having access to this information. The amount of like DMs I have gotten, like, how do I get my hands on this? Like I'm starting my own business. I'm starting my own label. I want to understand how to do this. I want to understand my power. That's been really amazing. I think it's just kind of like, how can we empower this culture? As we're educating people, how can we also empower them too? I think that the business of X, X being hip hop or some other type of industry has been a hot topic and a growing one that I think has had both the consumer and business interest. And I'm saying that because I've seen that with my business too. I knew that Trapital was going to have business insights and it was going to be a go-to for several people that are in the industry, but learning more and more the people that are casual consumers of hip hop that don't even necessarily need this for business reasons. It's the entertainment aspect of, oh no, this is interesting. You're talking about something that I am a part of, even though I don't directly work in it. And I think that speaks to that broader gen hip hop aspect. I think additionally, I've also realized that so many of these insights cross themselves over into broader culture in general. And that is what I think carries a lot of the weight. Like I've realized that in my own business and I'm sure with that too, because as many people have said, hip hop culture is now American culture in so many ways, something like this becomes critical in that. That's exactly it. I used to go into these meetings with guys who I won't name names or companies, but you know, people who had this very biased perspective on what hip hop culture is. And it's like, your son is at Rolling Loud right now. Or like, you know, it's like they don't see it because it's right in front of their face. And I used to go in and challenge them, like go 24 hours without getting influenced by hip hop somehow, like start watching now. Because whether you're talking about a sports game, whether you're talking about an ad on the subway or, you know, the Popeye's ad, like it's there. Hip hop is everywhere. You cannot escape it. It's exactly good. Hip hop culture is American culture, but hip hop culture is youth culture too. And we know like all good trends always come from youth. And so I don't think this is stopping anytime soon from what we can see with our predictions. It's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger. I can see there being a future aspect of that with the report, too. It touched on that a little bit about how other cultures were using hip hop as something to be able to evangelize the youth or have something where they can connect with it. And I've seen that in a lot of my own work as well, looking at the globalization. And I think a lot of this, as you mentioned, was centered around American culture. But I do think that that is that next layer, because that's been fascinating to watch. And I think that's an under-researched area. Totally. I think we're aligned completely because this was volume one and we're like, okay, let's get the foundation in place. Let's understand what it looks like here. Let's understand what, you know, in our own backyard. But we did, there's a whole chapter on the global story of hip hop and how that's playing out in five different countries. And a lot of them were really surprising to me too, like seeing how hip hop is playing out in South America. China's super interesting one because there's so much regulations there. You know, we know it's, I think, three years running now. Hip hop is the number one streaming genre worldwide. Spotify. Also, shout out to Spotify for always making their data available. Very helpful. But it's been great to see it keep growing because I think when you come from it too, like, I don't know, like, obviously we didn't discuss our backgrounds. I shared mine, but I don't know if you grew up like super into hip hop culture too. But 
so many people think it's like a phase or a trend or like this little thing. And when you've been in it for 20, 30 years and you're seeing like, no, no, no. First of all, it's not a trend. It's been here. Okay. Like we're just getting the recognition we're getting now because we have access to data and statistics and listening data. But second of all, like it's not going away tomorrow. And so that's exciting. And when we think about volume two, volume three, where that can go, the idea of the global power of it's really exciting too. Mm -hmm. I've grown up always feeling like this culture was part of my life in so many ways. And it's interesting because I think now what's become a bit more accepted, like this is just the way things are, like was not the way at all growing up. But in so many ways, you still felt like the conversations were just as present in there because you yourself or I myself was in it. Yeah, I think for me growing up in it and just seeing the audience change too, like with Revolt, we went to Rolling Loud a couple of years ago down in Miami, and it was, I think it might have been like their, at this point, their five year anniversary or something. And I'm from Fort Lauderdale. So growing up in South Florida, I would go to all these hip hop shows. Half of my friends in high school were slash still are trying to become famous, like rapping. And shout out to my friends who are in their 30s, still trying to, still trying to make it. It's going to happen, guys. Keep, keep it up. Um, but, you know, when I was at these shows, the audience was very different. And I could go to Rolling Out a couple of years ago. And even for me, it was crazy eye-opening. And I know that the audience has changed and the experience has changed and who's accepted and not accepted. But we were all joking that this is like the Woodstock of hip hop. Like everyone's just there. We, we did this video piece and they're just like, you know, I'm just here. It's all good vibes. Like everybody loves each other. And I was just like, what? Like I remember time having to like go duck under a car at certain things. And so like something else we found in this study was the fact that I think it was like 65% of youth say hip hop is the most inclusive genre and accepts everybody. That wasn't always the case. And so it's been crazy to see this evolution now of like, almost a hippie movement of anyone going to these shows. I love it. I love being surprised by it. I love the fact you can't look at somebody anymore and think like, oh, that's who listened to this kind of music. I think it's a beautiful place we're in society right now. But I also hear you that like, there is this irony to it a little bit here. I've been to a few music festivals. The most recent one I went to was Outside Lands. And I think that even the variety and the evolution of these festivals tells a lot. Looking at Rolling Loud, I know that they had several issues like when they had first started in terms of both safety and logistics. But I even know like Lil Wayne's Louisiana Festival had its fair share of issues this past year. And I'm glad that we're at the point where as ironic as this is to say, those incidents can happen and it's no longer this black mark on hip hop mm -hmm. as a whole. Because back in the day when Rum DMC would add concerts and other folks would have concerts, it was hard to be able to justify a tour without an R&B cosign or some other type of group that had to soften a all rap cast that's going on stage. It really wasn't until you got thick in the 90s where it was like, okay, this all hardcore rap crew can go on and do that. And then now we're at the stage where the people that are having their own festivals and tours, it's the hip hop artists that are leading that. Yeah, I know. I think collectively, like as a culture too, when those things do happen and it's not because it's hip hop culture, but just like, you know, shit happens within any genre. But I think like as a culture, when that does happen and it is hip hop event, we're all like, oh, no, come on. Like, you know, there are those people and those advertisers and those brands who get scared and it scares them off. And so I think you're so right. It's been so amazing to get to a point. I look at some of these brands and advertisers who are aligning themselves with these like major hip hop events. And it's crazy. You'd have never seen like a PNG or like these more wholesome Johnson and Johnson. Whereas now, hello, you look at like, I don't want to keep going back and back on Rolling Loud, but like even like Coachella when it's headlined by hip hop artists, these are like mainstream events now. And so, I mean, there's something to be said there too about once one thing becomes mainstream, then it comes to this whole other set of problems. So I think the world is finally now seeing what we all knew 10, 20 years ago. And so it's so nice to have that like validation now of what we knew to be true. It's finally happening. It took some time, but I think we're at a good spot. So we're getting to the tail end, but before we let you go, is there any thoughts or is there any parting words that you'd like to give to the Trapital audience or you think they should know about or anything that you'd like to plug? 
Yeah. I mean, I mentioned earlier, but in case you missed it, if you want more on the study that we keep pointing to, <laughs> just visit genhiphopstudy.com. There's a field there people can fill out and then we'll follow up with them and get them a copy, either digital or physical. But I mean, we talked about so much that I think was so important and powerful. I just think that's it. I think if I could leave people with one thing, it's just stop trying to target people based on your own biases. We all have them. I mean, I have them, you have them, everyone has them, but the more we can be aware of them and the more work like this can be done. I hope someone does like a gen country and a gen rock and like there, I hope all these other genres, you know, get their thought leadership pieces off because I think the more we can explore people from a passion standpoint and less from a demographic standpoint, I think the better off we'll all be. And I know specifically for marketers and advertisers listening, it's definitely something that I wish I could spend time with every person and every job and and help them understand. But also I think we talk so much about where Revolt is heading and what Revolt is doing. And so this has been such a major piece for us, but I always tell people like Revolt is only six going on seven years old now, which is insane. I think people think we've been around forever and we're like the ABCs or the Disney channels of the world who have been here for decades. We're such a toddler still. We're in our like toddler phase. And we started out as a linear TV channel. We still do that. We kill it on linear. You can go to revolt.tv if you want to know what channel it is for you. We also have now expanded to do digital content. We have a huge social media presence. We now have our live event every year, the Revolt Summit, which if anyone's in LA should highly, highly plan on attending. I think That was also a huge eye-opener for me last year, seeing who turned out and seeing the audience we have a hold of. It's just like so beautiful and creative and collaborative. Revolt is just going to keep getting bigger and bigger. And our whole goal is always to meet our audience where they're at. And we know like anyone who's listening to this knows consumers are no longer kind of like siloed. Oh, I'm only on TV. Oh, I'm only on social media. Like everyone does everything. We all dabble in all forms of content and experiences. And so we're trying to mirror that. So if it's a live event you want, we do that. If it's TV you want, we got that too. And so we're in a really fun growth phase where we're just able to flex into any area our audience is in. Who do you think Revolt looks at as the competition? Like who is the media company that you most look at? It's such a tricky question because even since I've been there and I've only been there two years, I think who we consider our competition has changed because we've changed. So when I first got there, we weren't publicly saying that we were focused on hip hop. We were a music network. I don't think anyone ever thought that wasn't the case. I agree. I agree. Obviously, we're founded by Diddy, like Mr. Black Excellence, Mr. Like Created, like Godfather Hip Hop. So I agree. But it was an internal decision that we're going to stop referring to ourselves as a home for music, but we are a home for hip hop. And so prior to that, people might have said, oh, the MTVs of the world or whatever. And now that we've shifted It's so hard and so tricky because we do live across so many platforms. It's like if you're talking on social media, there's times when maybe complex, maybe the shade room. You know, it's like where else is our audience located at? And it just depends. I didn't expect you to say the shade room. You know, there's a huge overlap and I can tell you that statistic. I just didn't expect you to say the shade room based on how, but just from a positioning perspective. Yeah, we're definitely not a gossip column. We're not trying to be that. But when you're talking about the audience we're talking to, I can tell you statistically speaking, there's a huge overlap there. You know, when you say who's our competition, it just depends on where we're at and what we're trying to get across. And I think that that is a great thing for us is that the really isn't any. When we go out and we're talking to partners, it's like you really can't compare Revolt to anything because it is the brainchild of Diddy. And you can't put that in a box, just like you can't put Revolt in a box. And so it's really hard to be like, oh, we're the new age X or we're, you know, the new version of this. It's not. It's this totally new thing that is catering to an audience that was underserved for so long. And so wherever the hip hop audience goes, that's where we're going. And that could look very different tomorrow. But we're lucky that we're at this place right now where we're we can adapt to that very quickly as well. I mean, we don't have to name companies here, but no, Complex was the one that came to mind. I, for, I for, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I think that's a good note to end on. Lindsay, it's great having you. As she mentioned before, make sure you go to genhiphop.com, download yourself a copy, and follow Revolt for all the content coming through. Lindsay, thanks again. Oh, so thank fun. you. I could have done this for two more hours, so well, maybe we'll do a part two. Yeah, maybe it'll be a part two. <laughs> If you enjoyed this podcast, please tell at least one friend about this podcast. Word of mouth is still the best way to grow. Go to Apple Podcasts, go to iTunes, leave a review. 
rate the podcast. I will screenshot and share the podcast ratings on Twitter and Instagram. That can encourage more people to share the podcast. And if this podcast is your first introduction to Trapital, then make sure you check out the rest of the content. Go to Trapital.co. That's T-R-A-P-I-T-A-L dot C-O. Sign up for the weekly newsletter. Get all the content there. And also, shoot me a text. That's also a great way to stay in touch with Trapital content. You can text me, Dan Runcie, at 415-234-3074. Thanks again. See you next week.